thank you very much, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether uh, 15 minutes will do justice to what I uh, would like to really say. Uh, but I'd like to start with uh, some real uh, stories, and then I'll, I'll go to what I have to say here. Uh, the first story relates to uh, an experience uh, in the mid 1970s, uh, mid 1970s, when I was uh, in China, we just came back from from what we got a very class for Allah. Uh, and uh, I, I think I was in ninth grade. And so the experience really related to, uh, at the time we came back from, uh, from the uh, Somali uh, language uh, campaign. And so, so when we came back, I was uh, young and, and growing then, and I was uh, really interested in, in sports. So I became uh, very interested in, in basketball. So there was an orientation, I was born in Beidou, and there is an orientation, uh, it's called the PRO, Public Relations Office, you know, uh, some of you uh, know that. And so the orientation is where uh, the Ziad Barrett regime uh, uh, tried to uh, inculcate the people about uh, scientific socialism. And also, in my own case, I was interested because it also has a basketball court. And that is what I was interested in. Every night, uh, when I, uh, around 7 o'clock, I can see the, the basketball lights. Just two years before that, we had uh, installed, or the government installed, some uh, high beam uh, basketball lights. And, and, and so we could play basketball at night. And I could see from home and the walk between home and the orientation was very <coughs> exciting because I was looking forward whenever, whenever I see the lights. It was either an orientation function or some of my colleagues uh, convinced the orientation people that we could play basketball that night. Hopefully tonight I thought it would be uh, basketball, but it was not. When I came, uh, there was a colleague of mine, I thought it was in high school then, he was one of those uh, students who also became fascinated by the government is propaganda and scientific, scientific socialism. Uh, so he was sort of an educated uh, in weather in that in that sense. And and in front of him were about 20 or 30 mothers, relatively uneducated mothers. And tonight he was saying uh, in Somali, while is Ambarena our meaning <laughs> we will stigmatize people. He was actually trying to stigmatize and calling names to mothers relatively uneducated who did not participate in the self-help scheme today, in the self help so who did not come to the self help today. So these are relatively uneducated mothers. And this uh, young 9th, uh, 10th grade student was actually a colleague of mine, was shouting out of his lungs and saying, what is Ambarena, what is Ambarena? And so, Paloma has said, Adam, what is Ambarena? <laughs> so, now, I, I thought that was just quite fascinating. And I want to relate that idea uh, to the notion in which uh, the Somali society in its ideology from the first government to the Yad government today has used certain kinds of national narratives that are assumed uh, to be sort of a holy scripture or muqaddas. And therefore, if anybody deviates from that idea, the notion is uh, simply that that person is stigmatized or to be simply well, in, that, in that sense. So if I deviate, I'm asking you not to ambare me to <laughs> So with that forward, I attended a, a conference. I attended, actually, I was in Columbus, Ohio uh, a number of years, a year ago, actually, when the Ethiopia regime uh, uh, invaded uh, Somalia. It was uh, a Sunday, I think, uh, December 19, uh, December uh, 25, and, and I went to a coffee shop in, in Columbus, Ohio that morning, and I saw the, an interesting event where the entire people that came into, into that, into the coffee shop, were divided into one group that were celebrating and another group that was very sad. 
right? And some of you who are old enough have seen the O.J. Uh, Simpson uh, uh, trial uh, in the 1990s where you saw two pictures, one white population uh, totally sad and another black population celebrating. A picture in which two groups see two, one reality in two different ways. You wonder how did that occur. Now, uh, well, so this happens many, many, many times. A gathering is either characterized as another gathering is it's just like that. Those with the government, those against the government. So with that forward then, and I, I don't have much time, I want to just read quick a uh, few things and come back to here. So in that sense, the uh, conventional Somali historiography is derived from the assumption that the society has been and remains as a nation sui generis, a priori, if you will, or what Somalis call mukaddas, holy nation. The most revealing expression of this sentiment is found in my good friend's uh, work, actually, it's a matter, 1987 is titled, Somalia, a nation in search of state. The assumption is simply that Somalia is a priori a Mubattas nation. The only thing that's left is uh, a problem <coughs> of the state uh, uh, parameters in that sense. The title, as it were, represents a long <coughs> line of research that depicts the society as a seamless homogenous entity, downplays and sometimes violently oppresses any mention or of social and political fault lines. The only acknowledged political and social fault line, according to the nation in search of the state thesis, are those that resulted from <coughs> the Gerenc Shishay. That any fault line that's acknowledged is that of Paragerenc uh, Shishay. Paragerenc Shishay is a code word for anything that you wish. That, except it debouts the Somali people from human agency. In this sense, the Somali people do not have any agency in what they do. Everything that happens is simply as a result of Paragerenc Shishay. It could be uh, uh, European or otherwise. <coughs> now, for the methodologically and theoretically informed scholar, however, locating the social fault lines of the nation on foreign or foreign intervention or individual dictators, in this case, Siad Barre, right? Only, just Siad Barre. Alone is to paraphrase uh, uh, a, a number of interesting uh, uh, scholars. Uh, some of my friends, which is shouting the wolf when the predator is, in fact, uh, not the wolf, but one of the sheep itself. This kind of historiography is more ever, moreover analogous to the tale of the African peasant who was stopped by a travel in a larger car and asked the way to the city, who responded, after reflecting on the matter a while, if I were you, I wouldn't start from here. So my historiography, in other words, uh, it starts from where the African peasant works against by concentrating only on uh, one foreign intervention or another or a particular dictatorship or a single individual. The point is not to uh, dismiss the effects of colonialism or post-colonial uh, regimes on the traditional structures of Somali society or any of the other colonizing people for that matter. However, we suggest that conceptualizing the idea of Somali death in terms of mere interactions between colonial overlords and undifferentiated local masses may not be a sufficient cause to have, have, to have totally disturbed the Somali uh, social tradition, social tradition, uh, the Somali traditional tree under which it is pleasant shadow, all social and legal problems were amicably uh, resolved. Uh, what I'm really trying to suggest is that of course, I'm not uh, undermining the suggestion that there is a global geopolitical interest, regional and global in this sense. But however, uh, scholarship, true scholarship asks us that we have to truly concentrate on human agency as well. We have to look at what are the social, political, and economic actions that the people themselves engage in uh, that contributes to this. Now, uh, I want to move to this then, uh, uh, to suggest the idea of the multiple and contested identities. The argument is that Somalia is not necessarily this undifferentiated masses, uh, but rather a society that contains multiple voices in this sense. Uh, what I want to do is, uh, I've got a few, show me one, five minutes left. 
uh, give me a sign. Uh, 